Step into my time machine. In the next 20 minutes, we're going to travel almost half a century. The year is 1980. You're looking at the front panel of a Sony PCM1610 digital audio processor. At this time, there are no DAWs. There's no DSP. Everything has to be recorded in real time to a videotape recorder. 64 kilobytes of RAM is what's normal on the very few personal computers that are available to us at this time. And none of them is capable of recording high-quality digital audio for more than just a few seconds. Large hard disks simply weren't available at this point in time. By the year 1995, this will be a very expensive boat anchor. There are a lot of things that Sony got right at this time, and there's one thing that I'd like to concentrate on right now. Let's take a close look at the meter. Very strange scale, isn't it? A lot different than we're used to seeing in digital audio. 0 dB is 20 dB below the top of the scale. And there's a very fine setting right here where you can send your test tone from your console at nominal average level, also known as 0 VU at the time, and calibrate the meter. And Sony was trying to indicate that average level is all that you should be caring about and let the peaks fall where they may. This machine was succeeded by the Sony PCM1630, and they changed the scale because I suspect that nobody understood it. Well, let's take a look at what happened in that earliest time, from 1980 through till about the year of 2000, when the loudness war, as far as I'm concerned, was won. Back in 1980, in those earliest days, we recorded a few compact discs at that average level of 20 dB below full scale. And these CDs were very quiet and probably very natural sounding as well. But soon, engineers discovered peak normalization. At that time, we were very comfortable setting just the highest peak of the material to full scale. There might have been just one or two peaks in the entire program hitting full scale. The next thing that happened was that somebody discovered if we copied the signal to analog tape or if we used an analog tape and transferred it to digital audio, peaking it to full scale, we could get a free 6 dB loudness increase. That's because the peak to average ratio of analog tape is about 14 dB or perhaps 12 dB if you saturate it more. So if we set its peak to full scale, we'll get a free 6 dB compression without any work at all. The next thing we started to do, at least with our digital sources, was apply some light analog compression because we just couldn't compete with that analog magnetic tape without doing some further compression. In police work, when they investigate arson, they look for the accelerant. What happened next was what I call the first accelerant, the invention of the car CD player. The car CD player was only an accelerant for the loudness race because of the practice of peak normalization. If engineers were trying to reduce the dynamic range in order to play the CD in the car without losing the low-level passages, we began to use more analog compression, and then we adjusted the peak level to full scale again. So the average level kept on moving up. Then we started to apply some delicate analog peak limiting. Until the next accelerant came along, which was that by the year 1990, we had some affordable DSP, for example, the Harmonium Mundi processing, which was somewhat affordable by the large studios, and by 1995, very affordable DSP, as our personal computers had greatly improved and DAWs were available as well. So the war went on, and we started to apply aggressive analog or even digital compression, which was now affordable. And the next accelerant was... 
greatest hits CDs. Oh, this was a real heyday for the record companies because if the level of the CD was so much higher and all the old recordings sounded much too low, we could reissue the greatest hits of the artists at a much higher audio level. And probably by this year, in order to make them seem even louder than everybody else's CDs, we had to apply some aggressive high-frequency equalization. Remember, the fletcher munson effect says that if you brighten it up just a little bit, or maybe even more, it's going to sound louder. I'm not saying it sounds better. It certainly is pretty compressed by this point. And then the next accelerant that came along was the iPod. With even less dynamic range and with people listening to their iPods and their earbuds on the street and in the gym and with peak normalization and digital peak limiting, we could get the average level up even higher. Then we began to apply some digital clipping. We began to break the rules of digital audio and record beyond full scale. And we began to apply analog clipping, which means that we would send the signal to an A to D converter, clip that, and then feed it back to a D to A just in order to get more level and, of course, much more distortion. I suppose this was not all bad because we invented a whole set of new forms of musical expression that incorporated this distortion as part of their language, such as alternative rock. And by this point, we were clipping pretty seriously, invented some other forms such as grunge, the dirtiest of hip-hop, and another form that I would call shred by the kind of sound that was coming out. So, we've reached the year 2000. Now, the difference between the loudest and softest CDs that have ever been made is almost 20 dB. We've gone up almost 20 dB in 20 years. I thought and by the year 2000 that we had reached the limit, that we couldn't get things any louder. But boy, was I wrong. Because I would say that the year 2000 marks the end of the CD generation and the beginning of the Internet decade. The decade of downloads, MP3s, YouTube, and playback on home computer speakers with even less dynamic range. In the first internet decade after CDs began to wane, we find even more distortion, far greater distortion, and even less dynamic range. In the pop genres, almost every single transient peak reaches full scale, and we have both positive and negative peaks on this diagram, but for purposes of illustration, we'll just take a look at the uh, positive going peaks, and you can see peak, 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 and you can imagine what kind of distortion there must be in this recording in order to achieve this completely artificial situation. And I'm not going to let you imagine what it might sound like. I want you to hear the loudest master that I've ever had to produce. The first thing you're going to hear is the chorus leading into the bridge. Now, during the bridge, the sound is supposed to get soft and more relaxed and then slowly build as we come back into the final chorus. But I think you're going to discover that for all intents and purposes, the loudness of this recording is loud, 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 and loud, and that there's no buildup at all. So here's the loudest CD that I've ever had to make. And this was preferred and approved by the client.
pretty shocking. I'm shocked myself, especially for those of you who are familiar with my classical music work, my jazz work, my audiophile work. The next thing I'm going to play is the very first master that I presented to the client, which was rejected for being too low in level. As you're about to see, this master has some dynamic range, the drums have more definition, the sound is warmer, it's much less fatiguing. It's at a level, I'd say, that would be reasonably competitive for 1999. So what processes did I go through to make the final master that the client approved? I started inside of a DAW, and I clipped the signal going out of the DAW into some very strong, aggressive parallel compression in the digital domain. Out of the digital domain, I clipped once again, and I sent a signal into the A to D converter that was hot enough to put it 5 dB into overload. Out of the A to D, it went into the digital domain and met up with some peak limiting. Now that's pretty shocking, and uh, it just goes to show the kinds of distortion that the current 20-something generation seems to want. At least that was the request of my producer. The client preferred the master with more distortion and compression. I'd like to ask how much of this is loudness envy and how much of it is a true aesthetic preference. I think it's a little of both. I'd like to think it's about 90-10, that 90% of this is loudness envy and about 10% represents a true change of taste in the younger generation which this producer was trying to appeal to. But even though tastes are changing, it is a fact that very small differences in loudness affect listening perception. Most artists and engineers don't understand the issues, but they do understand when their master is played too low. In many cases, if I make a master that's 2 dB below the competition, it will be rejected. Of course there are exceptions. But even in the classical music genre, I've begun to discover classical music clients who are, are concerned that their master is not as loud as someone else's. And I've even had to do some, God forbid, peak limiting on classical music masters. This whole situation has really come to a head. Many clients think that mastering is the process of making it loud. Since the advent of iTunes, singles now dominate, and without the context of the album, the single is almost always mastered louder in order to compete. Only when the media, starting with iTunes and iCloud, becomes loudness normalized by default, can we hope to restore the sound quality to our music recordings. Now let's move forward to the very near future. Let's look at music mastering in the year 2020. By the year 2020, loudness normalized media will take away the competitive advantage of compression. Loudness normalized media reveals that overcompressed masters sound wimpy, small, and distorted. We hope that music mixing and mastering will return to a more dynamic style, or at least the media will permit our dynamic recordings to coexist with compressed recordings. And finally, artists will have an unencumbered choice in how they want to produce their own recordings. Will we need digital sample accurate peak limiters when the music media become loudness normalized? The answer is hardly ever, since the crest factor of 99% of mixed music 
is less than 22 dB, so peak protection will simply be unnecessary for pre-recorded programs. Peak limiting will still be necessary if you're mixing a live show or if the peak level of a special effect is so high that in order to make it sound loud, it would exceed minus 1 dB true peak. And in that case, use an oversampling peak limiter, which limits to the true peak level. Peak limiting for aesthetic purposes. If the transients sound excessive to the ear, then peak limiting will be useful. But digital sample accurate peak limiters were designed to be invisible and transparent, so those devices may not be the best tools to soften transients like snare drums. Compressors and analog limiters are better suited for the aesthetic purpose. But the year 2020 will not be all peaches and cream. Let's consider what I call the acoustic advantage. What is the acoustic advantage? Simply that listeners want soft material to sound soft, closer to its natural loudness, for example, harpsichords. The ears don't want to have equal loudness for both small and large groups. But today, in 2011, peak normalization exaggerates the acoustic advantage. Small group recordings, which have a low crest factor, that is, that don't have any percussion, can be pushed 10 to 14 dB higher than large groups. Large groups need to use all the headroom, though. So this makes the rockers very jealous, and it encourages even more compression. By 2020, Moving to normalized loudness will not solve the acoustic advantage, although it's greatly improved. For example, in the days of LP, I had to turn down a Mozart string quartet about 6 dB next to a Beethoven symphony, or a Bob Dylan solo recording next to Little Feet. Carol King sounds even louder than Metallica, and Mozart sounded louder than Beethoven. In 2020, the rockers will still be a bit upset about this because there will never be an automatic system to correct for the acoustic advantage. However, the situation will be much better than today, with only about a 6 dB perceived difference between albums perceived as too loud or too soft. We're returning to the dynamics of the LP, where the differences between the loudest and softest programs are going to be no more than about 6 dB. And in fact, 2020 will be a lot like 1980, and that's a big improvement.